Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar on um, a lipid guideline update. So thank you to those who are listening live giving up your lunch hours to learn a little bit about this topic and to those who are also listening after as well. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Anastasia Armbruster. I am a graduate of the class of 2009 here at San Luis College of Pharmacy. Um, I'm currently an assistant professor at the college with my practice site at Missouri Baptist Medical Center where I do adult internal medicine and cardiology. Um, I have no disclosures related to this presentation. So as you guys probably know, you're tuning into this webinar. There have been significant changes to both cholesterol management as well as blood pressure management in the last six months. Um, there will be another webinar in two weeks regarding the JMC-8 guidelines, so if you'd also like an update on that information, feel free to tune in at that time. So I think the first thing to remember about the new cholesterol guidelines is that these are not ATP4 guidelines. And so those are the um, ATP3 have put out the original guidelines, but realize this is a different group um, that has published these cholesterol guidelines. So a little bit about them. They were published last November. Um, this is the first update we've had since 2002 with the NSEP ATP3 guidelines. And the authors really took the goal of identifying patients most likely to benefit from therapy. So this was not intended to be a comprehensive approach to lipid management other than just looking for those patients who will, who will benefit from risk reduction. And you'll hear a lot about ASCVD risk um, with these guidelines, and so that's just atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So the guidelines do take a little bit different approach for risk estimate. And so it is expected to increase eligible patients for therapy from just over 40 million to about 56 million. And that great increase in eligible patients is estimated to come from patients age 60 to 75 without clinical disease. And we'll talk more about what is defined as clinical disease. So if you could only remember a few things about the guidelines, um, a quick overview. It's no longer treat to target, so we no longer have established LDL goals that we are hoping to reach in our patients. So there's no need to remember um, 130, 100, or 70 any longer. So that's probably the most significant shift in practice. Specifically, there aren't recommendations for patients with systolic heart failure class um, 2 to 4, and you're going to hear a lot about um, with these guidelines that really it's all going back to the data. And so these three subclasses that don't have recommendations are just coming from the fact that we really don't have specific data for these populations. Um, certainly in my practice, we're still treating patients with heart failure and who are on hemodialysis, but understanding that they're not well represented in the primary prevention trials that are used to develop this guideline. Another population that um, the guidelines have highlighted are those older than 75 who do not have clinical disease. And so I think it's always important that we look specifically at our geriatric patients. Um, this is one example of how um, the guidelines are changing. There is no data to support the use of non-statin cholesterol drugs, either in combination or in statin intolerance. Um, and the guidelines do make that statement, again, based on lack of mortality benefit from things like Zetia, niacin, and so they no longer really recommend using those agents. They also emphasize diminishing use of surrogate markers, so again, those had a surge in popularity, um, specifically C-reactive protein or calcium scores. So again, using those in conjunction with LDL isn't really recommended by this, this set of guidelines. So how do we um, divide up the different statin agents? And so you're going to hear high intensity and moderate intensity. Um, and so a high intensity statin agent is going to be one that lowers LDL by at least 50%. So this is pretty simple and straightforward. Um, you only have two agents to choose from at this time, atorvastatin and rosuvastatin. Um, those lowering LDL by 30 to 50% um, are considered moderate intensity agents. And so you can see the agents listed there. Keep in mind, if you have to reduce these doses for either renal dysfunction or drug interactions, um, keep that in mind when selecting doses. So again, the real goal of these guidelines was to identify patients that would benefit from therapy. And so the authors broke it down into really four groups um, that they feel can benefit. And we'll go through each of these groups in detail. So clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. 
Um, so patients who have had an event, and we'll go through all the events that fall into that category, meet criteria. Any patient over the age of 21 with an absolute LDL greater than 190, we have data to um, support use in those patients. Diabetics with an LDL greater than 70 were identified as a group who would benefit. And then we'll get into risk assessment. Um, so we no longer use the frame cam. I'll talk a little bit about the um, risk assessment developed by this group. But looking at 10-year um, ASCVD risk of at least 7.5%, which comes from the calculation, and an LDL greater than 70. And so these are kind of our four major treatment groups that we'll go through. So the first being clinical disease. Um, so this really encompasses a lot. Um, so any acute coronary syndrome, history of MI, um, any type of angina, um, any type of arterial revascularization, including coronary or peripheral, um, stroke or TIA, established peripheral artery disease, um, so all of these patients with clinical disease are going to receive high-intensity statin therapy. And so remember, that would be a torvastatin or rosuvastatin um, at higher doses. There is a caveat that if a patient's over the age of 75, you can reduce that to modern-intensity statin therapy. So speaking from my practice experience, um, I spent half the year with the cardiology group. And so for us, it's pretty easy because um, the majority of our patients have established disease, and so they all fit into the high-intensity statin group. Um, so the, the difficulty, or I think the misunderstanding, can come from those where you're thinking about primary prevention, and we'll talk about those. Again, any patient with an absolute LDL greater than 190, um, that adults age 21 or older, so that comes, again, specifically from the data, um, and they would also meet criteria for high-intensity statin therapy. Our next um, group that would benefit are those who are diabetic age 40 to 75 with an LDL greater than 70. Um, this would include type 1 or type 2 diabetes, um, and they would be eligible for moderate intensity, intensity statin therapy unless their 10-year risk from the risk calculator we'll discuss is also above 7.5%, and then we would move them up to the high-intensity statin therapy. So some struggles that I've seen with this um, as patients younger and younger are experiencing um, type 2 diabetes, we have some patients who are in the 30 to 40 range um, that technically don't fall into this group because of their young age, yet they still have a lot of cardiovascular risk factors um, due to smoking, obesity, a variety of things. So um, this is one place where we go a little bit beyond the guidelines and will treat younger patients um, despite that age recommendation of 40 to 75. So moving on to the 10-year risk assessment. And so, um, again, you have the age criteria of 40 to 75. And that, again, comes straight from primary literature. So there's no data available for patients age 21 to 39. Um, again, in my practice, if we um, have a patient who is younger, um, we will still be aggressive and use statin therapy. As with many disease states, there's little, little data available for patients that are elderly or greater than 75. Um, so the new risk assessment is actually a pooled cohort equation um, coming from some uh, primary prevention studies. So if you download it from ACC or AHA, I have the hyperlink included. We'll go through some apps that I find are, are a little more easy, uh, user-friendly. Um, but they've developed an Excel spreadsheet where you put in um, various risk factors and calculates actually your 10-year risk for ASCVD as well as your lifetime risk. Um, but we're looking at that. 10-year risk thinking about um, starting therapy. We'll talk a little bit about how this risk assessor is different. Um, one thing, it does include diabetes, whereas the Framingham did not. Um, based on the patient's risk, um, they may meet criteria for moderate to high-intensity statin therapy. If the patient has um, less than seven, between 5 and 7.5% risk at 10 years, um, the guidelines did offer expert opinion that you could consider treatment with a moderate intensity. So talking a little bit more about that pooled cohort equation. Um, so it is anticipated to target a larger number of patients for therapy compared to Framingham and the previous um, lipid guidelines. Again, they pulled data primarily from three um, primary prevention trials, and the event rates were derived from the placebo groups. So that's where these numbers um, and equations are coming from. 
Um, with ATP3, the previous 10-year risk had to exceed 20%. Um, it did only look at heart disease, um, and this new calculator adds the risk of stroke, um, which I think is an important addition. It's also more accurate um, for risk in African-American patients and females, as both of those um, criteria, you're at a higher risk for um, early risk, specifically with stroke. So younger patients are at higher risk, and it's estimated that this new um, calculator incorporates that more effectively. So of course, there's an app for that. Um, if you actually go to the website and download the Excel sheet, it's a little bit cumbersome to use. Um, obviously, this is the Apple version. It is also available for Android. Um, if you download the ACC AHA one, as of the last time I checked, it's still free. Um, so it provides a, um, a way to keep all of these things um, at your fingertips. So here's a screenshot from what type of information you would actually get from the app itself. So you can see in the dark blue there on the left, um, it's giving you your 10-year ASCVD risk um, at 19.4%. And so remember, the 10-year risk is what we're going to use um, to determine if the patient meets criteria for therapy, whereas the lifetime risk, um, obviously much higher, um, but not really uh, affecting our choice of therapy. And so I think it gives you, um, this particular app gives you a nice um, review of of the recommendations and what to consider um, and kind of includes all of the little caveats um, quickly and accurately. So we've talked about high intensity and low intensity, or I'm sorry, high intensity and moderate. Um, there is a low intensity statin therapy group and that would be any agent that's only estimated to lower LDL by 30% or less and the agents are listed there. The guidelines do recognize Patients may not tolerate high or moderate intensity therapy. And remember, they've recommended that even for patients who are intolerant, we don't use alternative cholesterol-lowering agents outside of statins. And so if a patient's not tolerating therapy, it is an option to continue to lower their dose or switch them to one of these less potent agents. So I mentioned that we no longer treat to target. Um, and so what kind of monitoring do we still need to be doing? And so from the guidelines, they do recommend checking an ALT at baseline and only repeating that if a patient has symptoms. They also rec uh, recommend a creatinine kinase at, kinase at baseline in patients at increased risk for myopathy. Um, so not something we need to be doing on everyone, um, but that way we have a baseline and we can repeat if the patient does have symptoms. So you might be surprised to notice we are still going to check fasting lipid panels 12 weeks after initiation and then every 3 to 12 months. And so remember that's really no longer for dose titration because we're no longer targeting a specific LDL dose. Um, this would more be for adherence and expected LDL reduction. So all of the mortality benefit is really coming from that expected reduction and so we just want to ensure the patient's responding appropriately and taking the medication. For the first time, we have a comment about low LDL levels, so I think it's something a lot of clinicians think about how low is too low. Um, and so these current guidelines recommend a dose reduction if two consecutive LDLs are reported as less than 40. Um, you can lower that dose in those patients. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with um, the issue with new onset diabetes and statin use, and so the guidelines um, just kind of made a mention to monitor for that um, and screen per the diabetes guidelines. And that's really just in recognition that there was a possibility at one time of association between statin initiation and development of diabetes. So just recommending for routine monitoring for new onset disease. So these guidelines have generated some controversy, although I will say um, not nearly as much as the new hypertension guidelines that you may hear about in two weeks. Um, but the biggest controversy is this overestimation of risk. So I mentioned that we have a much higher population of patients who may be eligible for therapy. Um, it's interesting, if you all think back to when you calculated Framingham's by hand, um, you knew exactly what factors weighed into the equation and how much, um, you know, this gets 10 points, that gets 8 points. Um, so now that it's presented as an Excel sheet, we don't necessarily know the math behind the equation and the risk estimator. And certainly a lot of people won't be calculating it by hand. So 
some experts believe that maybe age is playing too large of a factor in the updated equation. Um, while we do know that the risk of disease um, does increase as we age, uh, experts have said men greater than 66, women greater than 70, um, are likely to meet the criteria of seven and a half um, ten year risk. And so that's one major um, criticism you may hear about the guidelines. I have generated a few cases um, just to talk through and highlight some of the changes. Um, so the first case, um, a white male with high cholesterol, 57 years of age. Um, he's not taking hypertensive medications. Um, he's not diabetic. Um, he's not a smoker. And you complete his ASCBD risk calculator, um, and it's 7.2%. And so for him, he doesn't meet any of our first three criteria. Um, and his 10-year risk is less than 7.5. So he would actually be someone that we would not recommend statin therapy at this time. So looking at um, another 42-year-old white male with high cholesterol. So he is also not taking antihypertensive medication, not diabetic. He does smoke. Um, and so his calculated 10-year risk would be 9%. And so he would require high-intensity statin therapy based on his 10-year risk. So another um, white male, 61 years old, so this patient is taking antihypertensive medication. He's not diabetic. He doesn't smoke. He has a history of previous statin intolerance. His calculated 10-year risk is 17%, so quite high, well above 7.5. And, and so for this patient, you could consider moderate intensity therapy. Um, again, even with the statin intolerance, we want to try as much as we can to um, treat these patients. So now moving on to um, a Caucasian female with diabetes, so 48 years old, um, not taking antihypertensive medication. She is diabetic, um, and her calculated risk is only 1.8%. And so remember, diabetes was a special category um, with LDL greater than 70. So we would do moderate, recommend moderate intensity statin therapy in her, um, and keeping in mind that if her 10-year risk was greater than 7.5%, at that time you would use high intensity. Um, but in the diabetic patients, we only use the risk estimator really to decide which kind of therapy. They all qualify for some type of statin therapy. Case 5, so another young um, white female um, also taking antihypertensive medication, not diabetic, not smoking, um, with a 10-year risk estimated at 2%. And so again, she would be someone who wouldn't meet criteria um, based on her current risk factors. So she did, she's not diabetic, um, so we no clinical disease, um, so you're going to go straight to the ASCBD risk calculator. One last case, so a black male, 79 years old, not taking antihypertensive medication, not diabetic, non-smoker, However, his calculated um, risk is 13.7%. Um, so we could recommend moderate intensity statin therapy. And this is probably representative of a patient that some of the criticism is directed at um, because thinking that maybe just his age is what's driving his 10-year risk score. So I want to thank the Alumni Association for sponsoring this webinar. Um, this content came from a suggestion from um, a member of our alumni association. So if you have other content ideas, please feel free to submit them um, to Stephanie Hoffman. And I would love to address any questions that I can, or if anyone has any um, experience with these guidelines they'd like to share, certainly like to open it up for any comments, feedback, or questions. There is a box available um, if you'd like to type any questions. All right, I'd like to thank those of you who joined us live.